I, I taught school in a rural community at the Florida Georgia border. And I got to tell you, we had one of those third grade teachers who was an unfortunate teacher who disliked children. <laughs> have you seen any of those teachers like that? We do have them. And I'll never forget. And by the way, if I do a voice, I am not making fun of everyone. I just want to bring you into the memory with me, okay? So I'm at this rural community at the Florida Georgia border. We're in the teacher's lounge, which meant that it was the only room that was air conditioned in this entire school. This teacher came on and she said, I want you all to see what one of these little eight year olds left on my desk at recess. <laughs> and then she held out this piece of paper, and I know you all remember the piece of paper. It was that one that had that funny texture to it, and it had the, like the six lines. You know how you, could, you would make your, your letters like that? And here in a childish eight-year-old script, it said, if you're happy, will you tell your face? <laughs> So let me hold up a mirror to you. <laughs> what would your face say? If you're happy, would you tell your face? Let's talk about then this notion of radical resilience. Let me define it for you. First off, this is what it is not. How many of you remember that character? Okay. You gotta be able to take a licking and keep on ticking. Well, there was that resiliency, Bozo the Clown. The traditional definition of resiliency is to do what? It is to bounce back. It is to bounce back. And that's exactly what happened with that image, Bozo the Clown. And the, those of us who remember it, you remember you would hit that thing and it would come back, hit it, and you'd come back. Who wants to be hit and come back in the same position to be hit again? I do not think this is very smart. So to me, the definition of resiliency is not about bouncing back. It's this. It is to grow through. What will it take to be resilient if I'm going to be able to grow through? And I'll tell you what I think it's going to take, energy. At the end of the day, do you have the mental, emotional, physical hardiness that will create the energy that will allow you to grow through both adversity and challenge? We suffer from something called SAD. Situational Attention Deficit Disorder. Now, I hope you notice, by the way, the, the pronoun that I'm using is we. I do not come to you as a voice of wisdom today. I come to you as a fellow pilgrim on this journey that we call life. And sometimes I think I understand this well. And other times, quite frankly, I stink. And my husband says, Eileen, read your book. So I'm as I'm talking out loud to you, I'm talking out loud to myself. And so when I think of this suffering, this ailment called SAD, I'm going to describe some of the symptoms. And so that I don't feel like I'm alone, if you experience these symptoms, would you please say, oh yeah, can you do it? Oh, yeah. All right, so all right, so here's some of the symptoms. You walk into a room. You stand there and you think, I came in here for a reason. <laughs> Good. Got, all right, here, here's another one. You look down at your, your PDA, your day timer, you know, wherever it is that you keep appointments, and it says, John Jones, 10 o'clock. And you're thinking, I have no clue who he is. All right, now here, here's one of my favorite ones. In your, in your wonderful, proficient, productive best, you, uh, you make a phone call. And while the phone is ringing, you decide you're also going to answer email. You're ahead of me. <laughs> you're right. So that by the time the person on the phone says hello, you forgot who you called. <laughs> right? Your brain went out your nose. That's a pretty sight, isn't it? <laughs> 
you know what? This, this is multitasking at its absolute worst, and we do it all the time. The first research that was done on this actually came from the University of London, and they're continuing to track this and track this, that when we try to multitask that way, particularly because you're asking your brain to do a bunch of different things, you've got a visual component that's going here, you have the words that you're going to type here, then you also have the auditory side here, you lose as much temporarily as 10 points of IQ trying to do that. That is as much as if you had sat there and smoked a joint. So the next time you feel tempted to do this, just pretend, go, I'm not going to do this. This man had written the USDA wanting to know how to get dandelions out of the, out of the lawn. And they wrote him back. And there was this whole series of correspondence because nothing worked, nothing worked, nothing worked. And finally, on the guy's last letter, he says, I've tried everything. I can't get rid of the dandelions. Some very probably low-level but brilliant clerk wrote on the letter, then we suggest you love them. <laughs> How many of you remember the Apollo 13? All right. Would you not say that was a series of risk after risk after risk that, and failures and failures and failures? Do you remember that? I had the wonderful opportunity of literally being Jim Lovell's seatmate, flying back from a conference in Hawaii. And so I, I got to ask him a number of questions. And he said, everything that you saw on that, what, in Tom Hanks' movie, was absolutely true. One of the things he said is, if you remember that story, Everything they tried, it failed, it failed, it failed. And the engineers come to Gene Krantz, who is head of mission control, and said to him, this is, this is horrible, this is horrible. We are never going to be able to get these men home. And Krantz looked at them and said, and it could be our finest hour. That's a pretty powerful reframing a pretty powerful reframing. And we want that of our leaders now. Don't tell me what is all wrong. Tell me what is the opportunity that is there. Let's talk about passion for a minute. You've heard this word used a number of times while we're here today. And when we think about passion, what organ of the body do you think of? The heart. Here's the heart. This heart is an amazing pump. There are 60,000 miles of veins, capillaries, and arteries in our heart. 60,000 miles. That is 20 round trips across the United States. And one of the things that we're seeing in the research that we're knowing about the heart is that the heart has an extraordinary energy field. Do you know it is 5,000 times the energy field of the brain? 10 feet away, I can measure the energy of a heart. And when we think about being remarkable, when we think about getting people who will help us as mentors, people in a network, you know what they respond to? Heart energy. Have you ever gone into a room and the energy is negative? You can feel it? You go, whoa, something's happening here. <laughs> Don't know what, but I'm backing out. <laughs> Didn't come from the brain, it came from the heart. It came from the heart. And the reason I think the heart is so important is we think with the heart. It is our intuition. And intuition is becoming more and more valuable in the marketplace. My mother was one of the 1,074 Women's Air Force Service Pilots, or WASP who at the height of World War II, when every able-bodied pilot was needed to, com to fly combat missions in the European and the Pacific theaters, answered a call to converge on an air base in Sweetwater, Texas, to take over the military flying for the men who were called offshore. And when they were disbanded shortly before the war was over, they were literally told, thanks for your service find your own way home, and their records were sealed. And mom had to call my grandfather and ask him for money to take a train back to York, Pennsylvania. I thought, uh, maybe you'd like to see mom? She's cute.
You know, it is a story that was only started really being told two years ago when they were given the Congressional Gold Medal. And my sister and brother and I got to go back on behalf of mom to DC and receive it. Let me tell you though why I, I told you that story. Because when they were finished, women were not allowed back in the cockpits of military planes again for 30 years. They thought that what they did didn't matter. But here's the deal. They would have done it anyway. It was not our mothers who were upset with the way they were treated. It was the kids of WASP. We call ourselves cows. I'll give you one guess who gave us that name. <laughs> we were upset on behalf of our mothers. They would have done it anyway. And I realize now in retrospect, they did it because they knew what they stood for and they knew what they standed on. I would contend that they were radically resilient, but they did it because they knew why they did it. You now are called upon as, as chief audit executives to know what you stand on, what you stand for, whether somebody ever says thank you to you or not, because it is absolutely needed. And if you can be clear on that, I will guarantee you, you will be able to take a licking and keep on ticking. <laughs>